Hello, everyone. You are listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast. I'm Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the dynamic Joe Fordyce. Joe, if there was any sting still left from the Cutter Gauthier news for Flyers fans, I think Jamie Drysdale alleviated some of that last night in his Flyers debut. He had a really nice first game with the Flyers, and the Flyers went on to win in the shootout 3-2 over the Canadians. Joe, what did you think of Drysdale and that first impression he made? Yeah, I think, I mean, outside of scoring a goal, I don't know that you could have made a better first impression. Um particularly his uh, activity on the power play. You would have never known he didn't get, I mean, had one practice with <clears throat> this group of players. And you saw right away his um, ability with the right, the right-handed shot being, being able to walk the line and then push, you know, pass the puck back against the grain and their power play looked fluid, I'll say. And I feel like that has been something that's been lacking for most of the season. Um, I mean, it, it almost feels like an accident when they score a power play goal. And last night when they scored, I don't feel like it didn't feel that way because of the way the power play looked and it was due to him being at the top there. And, um, and then, you know, he made a couple really good plays in overtime to, to break up scoring chances and things like that too. So, um, I, I think he gave you a little bit of everything that you would have wanted to see. And, um, you know, it it changes the whole look of their defense pairings now. Um, and you notice his skating ability. It kind of jumps off the screen. Uh, it did last night. And that's a guy who has barely gotten any sleep in the last three days. So, you know, with regular practice and rest and all that sort of stuff, um, I really think you're looking at a guy that can kind of change the complexion of what this team does on the back end, both on the power play five on five and, and really a guy that can, um, that can cover up, you know, particularly like a three on three. I feel like the flyers outside of Sanheim, they don't really have defensemen that skate well enough to play uh, you know a lot of three on three stuff and this team has gotten themselves into a lot of three on three overtimes um and I feel like Drysdale is the perfect kind of defenseman for those not that this team wants to take a bunch of games to overtime but if you do and they play a defensive style a John Tortorella team you're gonna find yourself in overtime and uh I feel like he's the perfect guy to send out there right at the beginning of the overtime you know, with a couple forwards and he can move the puck, good speed. And again, that ability to shut down plays like he did last night. So um, really good debut. I got a sense he was running on a lot of adrenaline because as you mentioned, Joe, he had little to no sleep. Uh, He did get some sleep later on after practice Tuesday. And he said he took a nap before the game, but he had that 5.45 a.m. flight Tuesday morning practice with the Flyers. He found out he was traded Monday night. He said he had no clue it was coming. So for a young man, only 21 years old, going through this for the first time, I was really impressed. I thought he went out there and and did everything, as you mentioned. And, Joe, I think the, the upside is there. That's what's exciting, I think. He's only 21 years old and plays really the, arguably the toughest position in the game, the game, the position that kind of takes the longest to translate to the NHL level. So if he's doing this already at 21 – you have to really wonder where his game can go just with age, maturity, and and coaches helping him. So I think with the Flyers rebuild, you, you suffer a tough loss in Gauthier, but then you get a nice addition in Drysdale uh, in an area of need, an area of need. And we, we all know how badly the power play needs help, and he looks like a guy that can help it too. Yeah, and, and you listen to him talk after the game, both with uh, JJ and Bush on post game live, and then with you guys in in the uh, in the dressing room there. And you would have thought the guy's been here for months. Um, it it sounded like outside of the questions about, of course, the the travel and the getting here and the the, the sort of logistics of the trade. Um, you would have thought he he'd been here all season. Um, the way he was talking about playing with the players, talking about that power play, his assist on the power play to Frost, you know, 
it, it didn't sound like a guy that kind of just showed up on the scene. And um, I think that, that, that that's huge. Um, and, you know, he's also, also what I find interesting is, and, and I think we've seen this gradually growing um, all year. And, you know, it's kind of the, the Philadelphia mindset is um, to be defensive as a fan base when somebody says something against them. So when we hear what Jonesy and Briere had to say about Cutter Gauthier not wanting to be here, all of a sudden the guy they get becomes the guy. And you could tell last night that fans were cheering every time he got the puck. I bet you half of those fans didn't know who he was until Monday night. And now he's become the guy that everybody's going to focus on because the guy that went the other way to get him said he didn't want to play here. So it it's kind of become this. And, you know, I think I've used this in a, in a, in reference to the team, but it's kind of become this Jason Kelsey mindset from the Super Bowl parade years ago when it, it if you don't like us, we don't care. And then it's when you hear the things that Drysdale said about the fans last night and sort of you hear about Philadelphia and you don't really realize what it's like until you get here. He played right into that. So I expect that to continue. Uh, of course, they're going on a three-game road trip now, but I expect that to continue when they come back home. And um, I don't think he could have played that any better coming here knowing the circumstances in which he came here. And, um, you know, it, it adds an interesting dynamic to it. This The fan base, not that they weren't already, but I feel like this situation has kind of invigorated a um, another level to this fan base that we haven't seen in a, a good number of years here. And uh, I expect that to continue for sure. It really did seem like the fans have already – kind of latched on to him and in in a in a crazy way too uh sometimes when a team gets fresh blood or a new player it just naturally gives it a jolt uh just you know the locker room kind of rallies around the guy welcomes him in there's energy there's life and it seems like the flyers are getting that from drysdale they just seem a lot of them know the kid from previous experiences and uh, it just seems like his his presence gave them a lift in a time that they kind of needed it. They had lost seven and nine. Of course, the Gauthier news is tough to stomach. And here's this this young 21-year-old defenseman who looks like he has a bright future. And, yeah, I just think the Flyers are feeling his presence in the locker room as well. And we all know they they probably aren't going to be like a big buyer at the trade deadline. They they aren't really in a, in a mode where they're adding players. But here they add one. And I think they're seeing uh, just a natural jolt uh, to their lineup, which has been impressive as well. Yeah. I, and, I, and the other thing, too, is when you look at um, no one, I, I don't think the, the whole fan base is entrenched in college hockey and they kind of maybe saw some clips on Twitter or something like that of, of Gautier. But it makes it easier to embrace the guy when you hear – that the guy that doesn't like you or doesn't want to play here, you don't really know that much about him. And so it's kind of like almost like an out of sight, out of mind thing where, you, you know, you can, you can just say, okay, forget that guy. Then he doesn't want to be here. Forget him. This guy wants to be here and he's here now. So there's an immediacy to it where you don't have to wait to see the payoff. And again, I think people are inclined to like what Danny Breyer says and and like Keith Jones because they've provided this team this season that has a totally different look, a totally different feel. The building has a totally different feel. So when they come out kind of swinging like they did after that deal was made, I think it's a lot easier to get behind it um, because – this regime so far has not given you any reason to not get behind what they're doing. And I'm not sure I've ever heard a front office contingent in lockstep with their messaging after that deal, like 
Jonesy and Briere were the other night. I mean, when's the last time you heard a fan, a, 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 a team president or a GM come out and just say, well, this guy didn't want to be here, so we just got rid of him, which is essentially what they said. Mm-hmm. And, but the thing is, they were able to keep it under wraps to get rid of him and actually get something and not have the cards get put on the table before the deal's made and then just, you know, settle for a a platter of who knows what to get rid of the guy. So they were able to keep things close to the vest, get a deal done for a kid that I think it's debatable you might have wanted to make this trade without all of the Cutter doesn't want to be here stuff anyway. And they were able to make this deal happen. Um, And I think it's a, it's a, definitely they get, you know, they get the, the full marks on that, making that deal and holding, you know, holding things close to them, but then coming out and being honest with the fan base. And I think that's what these people and this city appreciates the most. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. Joe, there was already a, a decent bit of youth on the Flyers' back end with Cam York, who's 22, Igor Zamola, 23, but now you put Drysdale in the mix, 21-year-old, and almost half their defensive core on some nights is going to be very young and a, a group with promise. But there's also decisions to be made. They have eight healthy defensemen right now, and they've liked the way almost all of them have played. Just how difficult do you think the decisions can be defensively? And does this give the Flyers maybe more incentive to make a couple moves at the trade deadline, uh, given they have – some vets here with expiring contracts. Yeah. I mean, I think you have no choice. I mean, you saw them run it and go out there with seven D last night. And, you know, we know Tor- John Tortorella has loved the way eager Yegor Zamola has played on the power play. And, um, last night, you know, he doesn't get that much ice time and that's not your ideal scenario. And it's not ideal for the fourth line because, when you're playing 7D, then there's two forwards that are just kind of getting moved all over the place and there's no consistency during the course of a game. Um, the last time they did this, I asked Scott Hartnell about it. I said, what's a night like that like for a forward when you play 7D? And he's like, well, the guys at the end of the bench just hate it. So that's not a consistent way to play. Um, so I, I think you have to be looking at, you know, uh, you mentioned expiring contracts. It's it's the Walker, it's Sealer, and 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 I think you got to look at possibly trading. You know, if you're able to move Rasmus Ristolainen, and I think maybe you try to sell high on him as well because um, you know he's been playing well. So I think there's definitely a lot there that can be worked with. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot on the table for the Flyers come the trade deadline uh, with their defensive picture. As you mentioned, Joe, Rista Lyons, like kind of an under the radar one, um, a, a guy that teams could like. And if the Flyers feel like they have a surplus and they want to see more youth on the back end. And um, yeah, I think they're going to have a lot of flexibility there if guys stay healthy. And I think it absolutely kind of fuels the, maybe the purpose or the reason to make, to move a guy like Walker, depending on where the team is. Um, I didn't think they had as much depth defensively and if uh, before Drysdale arrived. Uh, but if they were in a playoff push, I, I thought it would have been tough maybe to part ways with a couple of players. But now I think maybe they can, you know, just they have, you know, again, more just more flexibility to possibly do things here and see uh, see how it shakes out defensively, Joe. Yeah, I, I the other thing too is the the thing with Ristolainen is the term on his contract is getting less. And when you look at the money he's making, it's kind of the going rate for defensemen that play the way we'll say he's played over the last probably calendar year. Um, You know, he's not doing, he's not taking the reckless penalties and things that we saw when they first acquired him. 
and he's playing a, a defensively sound game with a little bit of offense mixed in. And so I think that whole thing, there was a lot of talk about what he was making, like the AAV on his deal and how much term was left on the deal. And, and the term is dwindling. And now the price, I don't think looks so bad. So I don't know whether the Flyers would have to pay a little bit of it to move him, or maybe they wouldn't at this point for a team that feels like he could be a piece to, you know, their, their middle pair or their third pair uh, for a Stanley cup contender. I, I think that he's an attractive commodity for that kind of team. So um, I don't think it's as difficult to move him as maybe last year when we were talking about this or um, at any other point. So I, I do think that's way more of a possibility now. Yeah, without a doubt. And I, I think the Flyers are probably thrilled just knowing now that they have eight healthy defensemen and it's a good group. It's a, I mean, it's a group that has exceeded expectations and then it just added a really nice young player with promise who's going to get a ton of responsibility I, I even looked at last night. It's like Cam York's not on the power play. I mean, this is a guy that was deemed the best defensive prospect in, order, in the organization, was a was a power play quarterback. And right now the Flyers have the flexibility to take him off the power play and maybe lessen the load of, on his shoulders a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I think the Flyers have a really good picture here defensively, and they're going to have be a team I think, that I think is going to field a lot of calls at the trade deadline. Uh, given their what they look like uh, defensively, Joe. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like this, the Briere and the Jones, Jonesy combo. I feel like they're a they're a team that teams around the league want to deal with these guys. Mm -hmm. the, these are guys that they, you know, we heard we heard the other night after the trade them come out and say how much they appreciated other executives out in the, in, in the league not leaking out the news that the Flyers were trying to move Gautier. Now, I mean, when do you even, when do you hear that? I mean, generally it seems, excuse me, it seems in sports now, you hear leaks before trades are made. It's almost a rarity to hear a deal just come out of the blue. Um, and that's what happened the other night. And these are guys that, um, it seems like people want to deal with and and it, and it seems like there's reasonable i think is the best word to describe it um and i think that really helps that really helps the situation and uh you know uh, you really can't i don't think you can really quantify what briere and jonesy have done to the image of this organization in, in a really short time. Now, I mean, you know, it's, it's sports are a, what have you done for me lately? But when you look at what they've done lately, there's no way to think about this other than, you know, the sky's the limit. They're, they're winning games. They're in a playoff position all while continuing to keep the messaging that, we're not there yet. We have work to do. So, and then they make a deal like the one they made where a guy doesn't want to be here. And generally those kind of situations are, and there was a little bit of talk about it. Of, you know, this is the first setback of the rebuild and all this kind of stuff. But I think when you look at it, it's not a setback because it's not like they just had to get rid of this guy for whatever was around. They made a trade for a guy that helps this team. And they clearly worked their angles. It's not like they settled for the first thing that came along. So I really think that they they couldn't be they they could not be putting a better face on what's going on with this team when you compare what's going on over the last three plus years before they took over. I mean, it's night and day. I really thought they handled it well for a few reasons, and the first one being it's not like they didn't try. I mean, if they they found out and last May that he didn't want to sign here. They gave it time. They did everything. They even sent Jones and Breer to Sweden at the World Juniors for a last-ditch effort. It's not like they didn't try. And two, uh, yeah, they the fact that they kept it under wraps, Joe, and it adjusted well, uh, you know, this could have been a disaster if you think about it for them this early in 
in the in their process here with the Flyers. I mean, obviously both were kind of hired full time in May. Um, if, if this kid didn't come and they didn't handle it well, like it, it, it would have been a disaster. But they pivoted very impressively, in my opinion. Uh, it's the fact that they got this kid in a pick in the second round in 2025. Uh, was a good adjustment, and it shows you they can react on the fly. And like you said, Joe, they know how to deal with other teams. I think, I think they were well respected around the league. I don't think the people are looking at fly, at the Flyers and saying, "Oh, Jones and Briere, they have zero experience. They can maybe be walked over." Uh, no, I think they, I think teams respect them and understand that these are two smart guys that maybe in the first year of their roles, but uh, they've definitely been around and know how to deal and handle with people. And the reality of the situation is there's a lot of front office executives in this league that are very new to their roles, including Anaheim's GM, Pat Verbeek. He is a rookie GM as well. Um, and Verbeek is a guy that both Jonesy and Briere played with, played in the league with, not with, but played in the league with. And, you know, I, I, I think that's a sort of, you know, it's the new generation of front office guys are these guys that played around their era. And I think that helps. And, you know, it's, I, I saw some of the, some of the coverage was kind of like, this is like I mentioned a little while ago, like the, this is, was the first setback of the rebuild, but I think that's a little premature to say that it's a setback because if take the names out of it, and say you're going to get the sixth overall pick from 2020 to come to your team for, um, you know, one of your first round picks. This guy's a, uh, I mean, as Briere called him a winger. I know they were trying. There was some experimentation with him playing center and stuff, but and a winger versus a defenseman. I'm not sure. Like I said, I'm not sure you're not taking that deal anyway. Take out any of the. This guy doesn't want to be here. All that sort of stuff. Just put the players next to each other and ask yourself if you would have made the swap for a team in the situation um, that the Flyers are in. I'm not sure the answer is not yes anyway. Um, so, again, I, I don't think, you know, you could have handled it any better. And really, I will say this, and, you know, Chuck Fletcher doesn't get a lot of credit and – I mean, there was a lot of things to criticize about his tenure. But now with this trade, and if you look back to the Giroux trade, the last two times this team has had their backs against the wall because of a player, the Giroux situation, where, you know, it was Florida and Florida only, and the return they got there, and then you look at this. If you're talking about starting a rebuild, and I know that, that you know, they've transitioned um, front office since then, but if you're talking about a rebuild, those two trades there look like the the cornerstone of this rebuild. I mean, one of your top offensive players that you acquired in the trade for Drew, and now this trade to add depth on the back end and youth to the back end and allow flexibility for the coming trade deadline. I mean, to me, that's that's what you have to be looking at. Um and not get caught so much up in, you know, they're in third place in the Metro and this and that. I mean, th this is, I mean, John Tortorella has talked about this part of the season, how this becomes a real grind. So maybe they stay in a playoff position, maybe they don't. But the fact that you can do that while also looking at, you know, the coming trade deadline and next year and, uh, and the year after, I, I really think that they've really set themselves up here for a, a, a successful plan. Perhaps for a little while, they did disregard the future when they were more in go for it mode. But I, right now, they I don't think they have disregarded the future at all. And it's been impressive because they're they're making something in the season so far. Halfway through they are halfway through the year, they are in a playoff spot but they still have had a very important focus on the future. I don't think you can argue that they've played young players. They've just gotten future type of assets uh, recently. Uh, and they had a, a full summer of rebuilding type of moves. So I think those are positives. Uh, if you're a Flyers fan and you're wanting this team to still focus on the future, not just try to win games this season. 
a crazy, crazy stretch for the Flyers, and it only continues. They got a back-to-back coming up on the road. Uh, a big stretch here for the Flyers under the microscope uh, in the NHL. We'll have it all covered here on the Flyers Talk podcast moving forward into the weekend and into next week. Joe Fordyce, our Flyers pre- and post-game live producer, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you. Great to chat with you. A big thank you to Ben Berry, our podcast producer and guru. And Flyers fans, as, as always, thank you so much for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, please rate and listen, and we can't wait to talk to you.